Hello Grade 11 and welcome back to this topic on quantitative aspects of chemical change. In the previous lesson, we revised the Mo concept. Today, we will apply this concept to gases. Let us join Keke as she works through this lesson. You should know by now that if you take a certain amount of a solid substance and heat it, the number of particles inside the sample remains the same, whether it is in solid, gas or liquid phase. This is because phase changes are physical changes, which means that it's only the way the atoms are arranged that changes. It seems logical then that the same principles that apply to the relationships between solids and moles should also apply to gases and moles. So why do we need to spend an entire lesson on gases? Well, in the real world, measuring the mass of a sample of gas is not always easy. Most often, a gas is measured by its volume, not by its mass. So for gases, we need to find a relationship between the volume of a sample of a gas and the number of moles present in the sample. By the end of today's lesson, you should be able to explain the relationship between the volume of a gas and the number of moles present in the gas sample. Explain the relationship between the volume of a gas and the number of molecules present in the gas sample and apply your knowledge to solve problems. To begin with, let's recap some basic ideas you should have heard of before. You should know that the air around us is a mixture of different gases. These gases work together in important global cycles to maintain the conditions that make life on Earth possible. But human activity has damaged the atmosphere through pollution. To prevent further damage, chemical factories need to find ways to lower the amount of harmful gases released into the atmosphere. In fact, today many chemists' jobs is to monitor the environmental impact of chemical factories. To do this, they need to accurately measure the amount of harmful gases found in air. But measuring gas is not as simple as measuring liquids and solids. Remember, a solid is a form of matter with a fixed shape and volume. The shape or size will not change unless you do something to it, like cut it or heat it. When heated, a solid changes to a liquid through a process called melting. The liquid that is formed no longer has its own shape, but it takes the shape of the container that it's in. This is a distinct property of liquids. Gases, on the other hand, don't only take the shape of the container that they're placed in, but a gas will fill the container completely. That's the principle on which these air fresheners work. As the liquid evaporates, the gas fills the room, and pretty soon, you will detect the smell of the perfume, wherever you are in the room. Let's go to the lab to watch an experiment to illustrate this idea more clearly. Hey there guys, look here. I prepared some nitrogen dioxide in this gas jar. Now if you look at it, it's a nice brown gas filling the entire gas jar. Now I'm going to place another gas jar, which is empty, over this gas jar filled with nitrogen dioxide. Remove the cover slip, and I want you to watch carefully and see what happens. Do you see that the gas is spreading out to fill both containers? The amount of gas obviously did not change, but the volume that it occupies did. This is a property that is unique to gases. These ideas about solids, liquids and gases that we've just recapped are used to formulate the kinetic theory of matter. This says, in solids, particles are close together and held in position by very strong forces. In liquids, the particles can move over each other and are not kept in rigid positions. In gases, particles spread out and fill the container that they are placed in. From these principles, it's important that you recognize that a certain number of gas molecules can be squeezed into just about any size container. But if the container is small, the gas particles are going to bump into the side of the container more often. This means that the pressure that the gas produces on the sides of the container will be high. So the volume of a gas cannot be studied without thinking about the pressure that the gas exerts too. And that's not all. Pressure can also be affected by temperature. When the temperature of the gas is increased, the particles will move faster and they'll want to occupy a greater volume. Look at this interesting experiment that explains this principle. It's quite easy and you can try it for yourself. This cold bottle contains nothing but air. If we now place a balloon that's half filled with air over the top, I'm sure you'll agree that the amount of gas in the balloon and bottle together will stay the same because it cannot escape. 
What will happen when we heat the gas in the bottle by placing it in hot water? Do you see that the balloon is inflating? The volume of the balloon is increasing because we have increased the temperature. The number of gas particles did not increase, but the volume did. That is very interesting, KK. How can it be possible that volume increases, yet the number of particles remains unchanged? Shouldn't volume increase as particles increase? Actually, this phenomenon was explained by a scientist known as Amadeo Avogadro. He hypothesized that equal volumes of all gases at the same temperature and pressure have the same number of molecules. Now let's go back to Keke to learn more about this interesting scientific discovery. Avogadro's principle states that equal volumes of all gases contain an equal number of particles under the same conditions of temperature and pressure. It's important to understand that this rule is true for all gases. If I showed you a gas cylinder filled with helium gas and a gas cylinder filled with oxygen gas, what conclusion do you think we could make about the number of particles in each cylinder? That's it. By applying Avogadro's principle, we could say that if these gases are at the same pressure and temperature, there will be the same number of gas particles in each cylinder. So, for gases, it would really be useful if we could find the specific volume of gas that represents one mole. But we could not just choose any volume under any conditions. We would have to include a standard temperature and pressure in our relationship. In science, we abbreviate the term standard temperature and pressure to STP. Scientists decided that the value of STP will be a temperature of 0 degrees Celsius and a pressure of 101,3 kilopascal. Now all we need is the volume one mole of gas will occupy under these conditions. Can you suggest how scientists would know what the volume of exactly one mole of any gas would be? That's it. They had to weigh out the molar masses of a lot of different gases in grams at STP and then compared the volumes that one mole of the different gases occupied at STP. Remember, one mole of a substance is its molar mass in grams. Using sophisticated scales and equipment and making sure that the temperature and pressure were at standard conditions, scientists discovered that one mole of any gas has a volume of 22,4 decimeters cubed. This means that this box, which has a volume of 22,4 decimeters cubed, would contain one mole of any gas at STP. I'm sure you'll agree that this is quite a large volume if you compare it to one mole of water, which is a liquid, or one mole of carbon, which is a solid. What do you think this tells us about the arrangement of molecules in the gas phase? Yes, the particles of a gas are actually very far apart from each other. Remember that all these samples contain the same number of particles, one mole. Now, we give this volume of one mole of gas at STP a special symbol, Vm. So, in the same way that we have a relationship for moles and mass, and moles and number, we can now write a relationship for moles and volume at STP. N equals V divided by Vm, number of moles, is equal to volume of the sample divided by volume of one mole, or 22,4 decimeters cubed. It's now time to put this formula into action. Let's consider the following question. What volume would a 0,5 gram sample of hydrogen gas occupy at STP? It's always easiest to start with the number of moles. So let's convert from mass to moles using the equation N equals M divided by capital M. The molar mass of hydrogen gas is 2 grams per mole, so now we substitute in. We find that there are 0, 0,25 moles of hydrogen gas present. Now we will use this value to calculate the volume of the gas. Our standard formula is N equals V divided by Vm.
But we need to find the volume, so we need to change the subject of the formula to get volume is equal to the number of moles multiplied by the volume of one mole of gas. That gives us 0 0.25 moles multiplied by 22,4 decimeters cubed, which gives us an answer of 5,6 decimeters cubed at STP. Thank you for that, KK. Let us recap what we have learned in today's lesson. The volume that a sample of gas occupies depends on the temperature and the pressure of the gas. One mole of any gas occupies a volume of 22,4 decimeters cubed at standard temperature and pressure. If the volume of a gas is known at STP, the number of moles of gas can be calculated using the equation N equals small m over big M. That's all for today, grade 11s. Make sure to attempt the task video at the end of this series. You can also find more information on this topic at www.mindset.co.za forward slash learn. Join me in the next lesson when we study solutions and moles. Until then, goodbye.